The United Kingdom to head to the polls again, barely two years after the last general election. And Turkey's president celebrates a win in the country's constitutional referendum. We'll examine the fallout from the biggest stories of the past seven days. This is Insight Review. Welcome to Insight Review, our look back at the most read and clicked and shared stories over the past seven days. It's been a week when the British Prime Minister shocked MPs from all parties when she announced the UK would go to the polls on the 8th of June. Also this week, North Korea tensions. The reclusive nation broadcast a mock video on state TV of one of its missiles engulfing a US city in flames. We'll examine those stories and more with our guests, the lawyer and broadcaster uh, Andrew Kidd and the journalist and broadcaster Maxine Mawinney. But first, here's Insight's Juliana Olienka with what you need to know about what happened this week. Seven days in 60 seconds. Britain's Prime Minister called a surprise general election due to take place in less than two months' time. Theresa May said a fresh mandate would strengthen her hand ahead of Brexit negotiations. A yes vote in Turkey's constitutional referendum handed the country's president sweeping new powers. Erdogan could now remain in power until 2029, once the country becomes a presidential republic. Uganda has ended the hunt for rebel leader Joseph Kony in the Central African Republic. The International Criminal Court first issued an arrest warrant for him in 2005. A 56-year-old man has been sentenced for the kidnapping and murder of the first missing boy to ever appear on the side of a milk carton. Pedro Hernandez received a life sentence for killing six-year-old Eton Pats in New York in 1979. And giant icebergs have appeared off the coast of the Newfoundland in Canada, weeks ahead of the iceberg season, prompting concern from climate change experts. We begin this week with the British Prime Minister's decision to take the UK to the polls again in just under seven weeks' time. Critics have accused Theresa May of political posturing, given the last general election was held in May 2015. However, she argues that Britain needs certainty, stability and strong leadership ahead of Brexit. I have just chaired a meeting of the Cabinet where we agreed that the government should call a general election to be held on the 8th of June. So I have a simple challenge to the opposition parties. You have criticised the government's vision for Brexit. You have challenged our objectives. You have threatened to block the legislation we put before Parliament. This is your moment to show you mean it, to show you are not opposing the government for the sake of it, to show that you do not treat politics as a game. Well, joining me in the studio today, the journalist and broadcaster Maxine Mawinney and the lawyer and broadcaster Andrew Kidd. Welcome to you both. Maxine, this was unusual for political drama, wasn't it? This was the governing party ahead in terms of number MPs in Parliament. They could have just carried on. Why did she do it, do you think? Well, I think, I think actually why she did it was summed up in a question by another journalist earlier in the week. Mrs May, what was it about your 20-point lead that sent you to the polls? She's in a very strong position at the moment, and she listed all those things that she's very unhappy with, the things that she thinks make her weaker, particularly with the other MPs, the criticism within her own party, the criticism from other parties, and it all boils down, at the end of the day, to Brexit. So we're going to have an election which will probably reflect all of those issues that we had in that Brexit referendum. What do you, what do you it feels think, a bit like unfinished business, doesn't it, from a whole year ago? Absolutely, it does. I mean, I, th I think she's absolutely right to call the election. I think the country is behind her on that decision. She's still governing on a 2015 David Cameron manifesto. I think it's absolutely right that she renews her mandate. It will make her much stronger in Europe. And, I mean, coming from the Europeans already are signs that they welcome this general election because it will make success, the success negotiations, all the stronger I, for I all, all the involved. The thing is, I actually don't understand that point. Why will it make it stronger? Well, it, she, there was scope for her to be undermined by her backbenchers, who are notoriously very powerful within the Conservative Party. So if she increases that majority, mm. she gets a renewed mandate, she will be much stronger. But, Andrew, she actually said, she looked the audience, the cameras in the eye, she told her electorate, she told her constituencies, we do not need mm. an election. Let us not put the country through the turmoil of another election. We'll wait until 2020. She did it 
half a dozen times. Exactly. And yet she's changed her mind. And do you also, think she's... She, she has also said Brexit means Brexit. Yes. Is there a question over that now, do you think? I don't think so. I mean, you're, you're right, Martin. She, she has changed her mind on, on calling the, the general election. But, you know, a lot has changed. And running the country is, you know, a really difficult job. And I think most people support her decision to change her mind on this really important issue. And they welcome the opportunity to have a say and to give her a stronger mandate. I think also it's interesting to look at um, how you can go to the polls, how you call a snap election. What mm. is the criteria? And there are only two. You mm. can either have a vote of no confidence in the mm. government or you have to have a two-thirds majority and if we look at the vote actually the other day it was 522 to 13 so she does have that support absolutely and, and nobody can really argue that this is manipulating democracy because uh, Parliament overwhelmingly voted in favor of calling this election so that's it's nonsense that she's acting anti-democratically I think my thought on this though is that if we do go to this election which we are going to all of those people who after brexit were saying well, if we'd known all this, we'd have voted in a different way. Yeah. Are they going to come out of the cupboard? Are they then going to vote with their feet Well, as for well? the average voter in the UK, it's still a, a few days away. We've only just had the call, haven't we? So uh, manifestos, pledges and everything haven't been finalised. But if you were of the opinion that you didn't want Brexit, you wanted to stay either as close to a member of Europe or as close to it as possible, who is going to be your champion in this poll? We well, don't there's know only, yet, Well, we? there's only one at the moment. It's the Liberal Democrat Party. Which, but we I have to say, is a very small political absolutely. party. Absolutely. Are you really going to put your trust in the Lib Dems and Tim Farron. I think the answer to that is most people will say absolutely Because again, not. I'm usually, Maxine, both the main party, the Conservatives, and the op main opposition are sort of in agreement that we are leaving Europe. Yes, they are. And, and interestingly enough, within the past fortnight, we've heard from Tony Blair, who said he might come back into the platform, not into politics, but stand on the platform with the Liberal Democrats mm. against Brexit. We've also heard from the European uh, Union this week saying, we would welcome Britain back if they changed their mind. Yes. You see, I think there's a lot to play for here. We looked at, look at the issues for Brexit. There was immigration, which was really the top one. There was, of course, the market forces, the economy, um, and also that strong feeling with a, a lot of this, uh, the public had who voted um, against staying in the European Union was that we wanted our country back, was what they were saying. And I think those feelings are actually going to raise again in this vote. So it's a general election, but I'm just wondering, is it also shades of the referendum. Well, I think we could be. I'm sure we'll come back to it as the, as the weeks and the drama unfold. We've got seven or eight weeks of campaigning in the UK. Let's turn to North Korea now, shall we? Tensions continue to rise there, particularly with the United States amidst military escalations from leaders on both sides. President Trump caused some confusion after claiming a US aircraft carrier was on its way to North Korea, when in fact the Armada was seen sailing in the opposite direction. And North Korea attempted to save face after a failed missile test by broadcasting this mock video, repeat mock, on the 105th birth anniversary of the former leader Kim Il-sung. The clip shows North Korean missiles engulfing a US city in flames. Andrew Kidd, um, that probably would go as par for the course under normal circumstances. We're not at normal circumstances with North Korea right now, are we? No, absolutely. I think um, everybody was surprised when it came out that um, the, the aircraft carrier and the, the so-called Armada was not where it was supposed to be. Um, I mean, one is a bit sceptical. Uh, how do you lose track of a 100,000 tonne ship? I think the answer is you, you don't. So I think uh, that sort of... Um, undermines a little bit the credibility of, of what was coming out of Washington We've last... We've come used to, though, disjointed messaging, haven't Indeed we, we, from have. a president yes. who is an independent tweeter, and the military, I don't think, contributed to that information no, flow. No, not at all. And I think also it's, we're into a situation now as who's going to blink first. We've got two very strong characters in North Korea and in the White House at the moment. Um, I, it was interesting, I was talking to some analysts last week and they were saying that the international community, particularly Russia, uh, Turkey probably as well, North Korea, those countries are sitting back thinking, what is this man going to do next? Because mm. he's not running to course. So they're not really too sure. Everyone's feeling a little bit... That could be a strength of the USA, of course. An be. unpredictable president? <clears throat> well, it could be. It could be quite scary too. Exactly.
Especially as he was eating chocolate cake as he was sending out his missiles, wasn't he? Uh, uh, exactly. Well, talking to President Xi, I think it was. Um, the, the concern, I suppose, has to be um, that America has sort of raised the rhetoric, haven't they, by saying that they think they've let it be known that Intel sources seem to think they know exactly where North Korea missile solar silos are. Uh, they seem to know um, exactly who's manning them at what time of readiness they are. And the threat seems to be they could take them out at a moment of their mm. choosing. Uh, absolutely right. I think we need a bit of a reality check here. I mean, of the 15,000 uh, nuclear weapons in the world today, North Korea has about 20. Mm. Um, half of them belong to the United States. I mean, is he, is he really a threat? Is North Korea really a threat? I mean, the only way they go, they'd launch a nuclear strike is to preempt or ward off some sort of regime change strike on the part of the US or South mm. Korea. Mm. It wouldn't be to launch some sort of Armageddon war, which inevitably they would lose. Of course, President Trump, Maxime, wasn't mm. there, but Mike Pence, vice president, mm. was, and this was some of what he had to say. Readiness is the key, and you, the instruments of American policy, should know. All options are on the table. North Korea is the most dangerous and urgent threat to the peace and security of the Asian Pacific. And those who would challenge our resolve or our readiness should know. We will defeat any attack and meet any use of conventional or nuclear weapons with an overwhelming and effective American response. Maxine, that was a real threat from a more conventional politician. Well, well it was indeed, but of course, it, it always goes back to the White House anyway. The president has to make the decision. The thing is, if you're going to make a threat like that and you don't follow through on it, where does that leave? President Trump and his administration. So it, it, it could actually be quite a dangerous situation because the, the North Koreans are determined to, to continue testing the missiles. Mm. If they do something that the Americans don't like, will President Trump push the button? The question has to hang in the air. And just a final thought on this video. I mean, I suppose it is quite possible we have to try and get inside the mindset of North Koreans. We know that communications, media and everything is not as readily available as in Western nations. Some citizens will really believe that an American city was damaged, won't they, having seen that video? Absolutely. I mean, we have the luxury of, of a free and independent press. We can verify everything we see. This video is really quite sinister. And when you've only got access to state control media, some, some people will swallow it, some people will believe it, and that, that's really quite disturbing. Some hints, actually, that mobile phones are maybe allowing external uses of internet and something to creep into North Korea. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Let's go to Turkey now, shall we? Last weekend, Turkey ushered in a new chapter in the country's history, with 51.4% of the population voting to transform Turkey from a parliamentary republic to a presidential republic in the process, handing President Erdogan sweeping new powers. Critics say the referendum has exposed deep splits in Turkish society, with the main opposition party voting to launch an appeal to invalidate the result, a move Turkey's high election board later rejected. While TRT World's Ediz Tiyashan has more. A triumphant scene outside the presidential palace in Istanbul. Supporters of Recep Tayyip Erdogan celebrating a referendum victory. Speaking in a televised address, the president announced the coming of a new era. Turkey has approved the constitutional change with the highest number of votes in history and the new developments will be at the service of all our people. We're going to shift our gear to the future together. The support for yes vote came mainly from central Anatolian provinces of the country. The coastal regions and Turkey's three biggest cities fell into the no camp. In Istanbul, hundreds took to the streets on Sunday night. Don't bow down was the message from protesters in the early hours of Monday. For the opposition, these results are not yet final. Turkey's second largest political party is demanding the vote be annulled. Well, of course, they didn't get approval for that challenge. Maxine Mawini and Andrew Kidd are with me to look back at the week's news. Maxine, it's interesting this on the international stage, isn't it, how other countries will react to President Erdogan's new powers. Interesting that Donald Trump, the aforementioned, tweeted support. Yes, he did tweet support, and he was one, I think he was the only Western, if we could call them Western leaders, who did that. 
I think what we're seeing here is increasing tension at home in Turkey and increasing possible isolation outside because already President Erdogan saying one of the things he wants to bring back is the death penalty. Now, he will, Turkey will not be allowed into the European Union if they have the death penalty. Um, other countries looking as well to see what's going to happen. A president in full power, is there that judicial checks and balances that we have in other countries, for instance, even including the United States? Mm. Um, and at the moment, the answer would probably be no. Um, interesting that um, the statements coming out from the president's office during the week that, oh, well, I don't really care about EU membership. It was, it was thought to be quite high on Turkey's aspirational agenda at one time, well, maybe not anymore. Well, it was, Martin. I think that was um, a real shock for some people to see that those statements coming out um, because, as you say, it, it was rightly thought that, that it was a big priority for Turkey and that's, that's a, a real change. Uh, game changer if they restore the death penalty because as you say Maxine yeah. it, it's a bar to EU accession yeah, that's and the yet line. Europe and uh, and Asia and the Middle East all intertwined here not least because at the moment with the Syrian conflict still going on President Erdogan and the Turkish nation have a deal with the EU about um, refugees do they not? I think I think what's going to happen is we'll have to wait and see for this to bed down and to see how President Erdogan deals both with the internal conflicts and the external problems mm. to see w how they're going to continue those relationships. At the minute, we don't know. We're hearing quite a lot of things. He might do this, he might do that. I think one of the worries is going back to the crackdowns and the, the people who were arrested, um, thousands of people arrested. After the coup. After yes. The coup, so the coup attempt, I should say. Yes, mm. the coup attempt, that's right. Um, so. Uh, there's a lot of concern about that. There's a lot of concern about human rights from outside. There's a lot of concern about restoring the death penalty. And there's a lot of concern about someone having as much power as that, as I say, without any checks. And in, interesting, the dynamics between Turkey's relationship with Russia mm. um, and the Syrian conflict and what it feels should be going on there and whether the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, can stay in office and everything else. Um, they're going to be a major player, Turkey, they, in this international they're, they're chess lynch, game, aren't they? They're a linchpin in, yeah. that, in that area. And mm. I think that's probably, it's going to be a balance for the outside, of those countries outside of Turkey, of how they deal with that. Because in fact, uh, President Erdogan in Turkey will be required in some shape or form to deal with Syria. Okay, Andrew, Maxine, we're going to pause there. This is Insight Review coming up next. The case of the first ever missing boy to appear on a milk carton is finally solved.